All right, good evening, everybody. This is Steve with Real Progressives. Tonight's going to be a, um, hopefully it'll be a fun, low-key um, opportunity to learn about the basics of modern monetary theory. I've done a lot of these types of videos in the past over the last four or five years, and, um, you know, it, it always is a little bit different. I try my best not to script these because I feel like, you know, when you script them, you try to be too perfect. And I think that there's something to be said um, for just, you know, hey, do I have this down? Can I really give this talk without having to look at a million different things? Um, but I did select three key uh, pieces of, um, you know, one is an article by L. Randall Ray. Uh, that came out shortly after the Modern Monetary Theory Conference in uh, New York City back in September. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this with you momentarily. And he basically, in this article, he lays out the things that he considers part of modern monetary theory. And I want to go ahead and just read through a few of them and see if this measures up with what you heard and maybe fills in some of the gaps. He says, let me finish with 10 bullet points of what I include in MMT. He says, what is money? An IOU denominated in a socially sanctioned money of account. In almost all known cases, it is the authority of the state that chooses the money of account. I was calling it a unit of account. He's calling it money of account. This comes from Knapp, Innes, Keynes, Jeff Ingram, and Minsky, Hyman Minsky. The second thing he adds, taxes or other obligations, fees, fines, tributes, tithes, drive the currency. The ability to impose such obligations is an important aspect of sovereignty. Monetary sovereignty. Today, states alone monopolize this power. Now, when he's talking about states, he's not talking about like Texas and New York City. He's talking about states like as in Russia, the state, the state, the state, not states, not the small states, but the state. And uh, he says, the ability to impose such obligations is an important aspect of sovereignty. Today, states alone monopolize this power. This comes from Knapp and S. Minsky and Mosler. That would be Warren Mosler, the father of modern monetary theory. The third thing he brings up is anyone can issue money. The problem is getting it accepted. Anyone can write an IOU denominated in the recognized money of account, but acceptance can be hard to get unless you have the state backing you up. This is Minsky. See how he's pointing to an economist who came up with this? So you're not just saying, oh, it's just MMT creating something. No, it's just got roots going way back. The fourth thing, he says, the word redemption is used in two ways, accepting your IOUs in payment and promising to convert your IOUs to something else, such as gold, foreign currency, or state IOUs. The first is fundamental and true of all IOUs. Our gold bugs mistakenly focus on the second meaning, which does not apply to the currencies issued by most modern nations, and indeed does not apply to most of the currencies issued throughout history. This comes from Innes and Knapp, and is reinforced by Hudson's and Grubb's work, as well as by Margaret Atwood's great book, Payback, Debt and the Shadow Side of Wealth. The fifth thing he brings up, sovereign debt is different. There is no chance of involuntary default so long as the state only promises to accept its currency in payment. Remember I said the state imposes a tax payable only in its currency? 
This is what he's saying right here. So sovereign debt is different. There is no chance of involuntary default so long as the state only promises to accept its currency in payment. That's why you're not going to see Bitcoin and other things accepted as payment. It could voluntarily repudiate its debt, but this is rare and has not been done in any modern nation, sovereign nation. So functional finance should be functional. This is number six. To achieve the public purpose, not sound, to achieve some arbitrary balance between spending and revenues. Most importantly, monetary and fiscal policy should be formulated to achieve full employment. The job guarantee, we were talking about that a little bit ago, job guarantee eradicates involuntary unemployment because a state imposes a tax, which creates the first unemployed person, which therefore means that we've got to solve for that. If you're going to create unemployment, you better have an answer for unemployment. And that's what the federal job guarantee is. Okay. So he says, uh, this is credited to Abba Lerner, who was, who was introduced into MMT by Matt Forstater. In its original formulation, it's too simplistic. Summarized as two principles, increase government spending or reduce taxes, and increase the money supply if there is unemployment due to the reverse of there if there is inflation. The first of these is fiscal policy, and the second is monetary policy. A steering wheel metaphor is often invoked using policy to keep the economy on course. A modern economy is far too complex to steer as if you were driving a car. If unemployment exists, I love this, here we go. If unemployment exists, is not enough to say that you can't just reduce the interest rate, raise government spending, or reduce taxes. The first might even increase unemployment. The second two could cause unacceptable inflation, increase inequality, or induce financial instability long before they solve the unemployment problem. I agree that government can always afford to spend more, but the spending has to be carefully targeted to achieve the desired result. I'd credit all my institutionalist influences for that one, including Minsky. Now remember, when we spend on the people, instead of just the military, when we spend domestically on the people, that's getting the money into the hands of the people. And that's the kind of good spending he's talking about here. For the reason the JG is critical component of MMT, it's number seven, it anchors the currency and ensures that achieving full employment will enhance both price and financial stability. This comes from Minsky's earliest work on the employer of last resort, ELR, from Bill Mitchell's work on buffer stocks and Warren Mosler's work on monopoly price setting. So Warren Mosler would say that the federal government is the price setter, is the monopoly issuer of the currency. And bottom line here is, is that the federal job guarantee stabilizes the economy. It is a superior automatic stabilizer and it is necessity. It's not just about whether or not you want people to work or you want a UBI or any of that other stuff. It is about stabilizing the economy. Okay. All right. So number eight is, and for that, and also for that reason, we need Minsky's analysis of financial instability. Here, I don't really mean the financial instability hypothesis. I mean the whole body of work and especially the research line that began with his dissertation written under Schumpeter up through his work on money manager capitalism at the Levy Institute before he died. Now, folks, this is heady stuff. I wouldn't expect you to know this. Some of this stuff, I don't know. But I'm reading it to you and we can always do what most people do with the internet and that is... Let me Google that for you. It's easy enough to find these things out. Be careful of your sources, though. Most people out there pick mainstream sources that are economically illiterate. Okay. Number nine, 
The government's debt is our financial asset. Remember, I was telling you about the two sides of the ledger, right? One person's debt, another person's asset, and so forth. This follows from the sectoral balance approach of when godly. Remember, I said that as well. Talked about the three sectors, uh, private, public, and rest of world. So we have to get to our macro, get our macro accounting correct. Minsky always used to tell students to go home and do the balance sheets because what you are saying is nonsense. Fortunately, I had learned T accounts from John Ramlett in Sacramento, who also taught Stephanie Kelton from his own great money and banking textbook. It's all there, including the impact of budget deficits on bank reserves. Godly taught us about stock flow consistency, and he insisted that all mainstream macroeconomics is incoherent. Now, one of the things that I wanted to say in the previous thing is that banks don't lend reserves. Reserves stay within the banking system. They never are reserves lent out. And so you oftentimes hear people talk about the fractional reserve system. Well, it doesn't exist. Never you know, It existed maybe back in 1934 when we were on the original gold standard, but it does not exist now and it has not existed in a very, very long time. Banks are not reserve constrained and they can lend pretty much at will. And that's why we need to regulate banks. It's why we need to make them act like public institutions serving the public purpose once again. Um, but they are public purpose. They just are very, very bastardized now because Congress has not done its job. You want to blame somebody? Blame Congress. All right. Number 10, and this is the last of his points. Rejection of the typical view of the central bank as independent and potent. Monetary policy is weak, and its impact is at best uncertain. It might even be mistaking the brake pedal for the gas pedal. The central bank is the government's bank, so can never be independent, period. Treasury and the Fed have a consolidated ledger, period. They were, they're one and the same. They work together. All this gibberish you've heard, it's gibberish creature from Jekyll Isle, maybe some historical anecdotes that are fun to talk about when you're playing Trivial Pursuit, but they don't really serve any value. The bank of today, the way we have it, they have a consolidated balance sheet, period. One and the same. And that's what he's saying here. So he's saying the central bank is the government's bank, so can never be independent. Its main independence is limited to setting the overnight rate target, and it is probably a mistake to let them even do that. Permanent ZERP, a.k.a. Zero Interest Rate Policy, ZERP, is probably a better policy since it reduces the compounding of debt and the tendency for the rentier class to take over more of the economy. In other words, the bonds that we sell are basically a basic income for the wealthy. But it's not debt because we keystroke that stuff into existence. He says, I credit Keynes, Minsky, Hudson, Mosler, Eric Timonet, and Scott Fulweiler for much of the work on this. And that right there is Randall Ray's short list of 10 things that he actually focuses on. Now, I think that it's worth talking about that for a minute. Randall Ray is one of the leading uh, voices of modern monetary theory. You think about the development team. You think about Warren Mosler first and foremost. You think of William Bill Mitchell out of Australia. You think of L. Randall Ray. You think of Stephanie Kelton. You think of people like Matt Forstater and Scott Fulweiler and Pavlina Cherneva and uh, Fidel Kaboob and a whole host of others. You think of the Modern Money Network with Rohan Gray and Raul Carrillo. You think of other individuals throughout different generations of people that have learned this stuff and have been a part of it. You think about Stephen Hale from Australia, you know, and then you start thinking about folks like deficit owls and real progressives and others that have taken the ball and run with it as well. You even got guys like Mike Norman who have done great work and Ellis Winningham, of course. And Ellis is one of the best 
um, economists that I know, best voices, best explainers of modern monetary theory that I've ever met. Him and Fidel Kaboob do great work. So does Dr. Hale. In any event, uh, I wanted to make a point, though, that of all these voices out there, they don't get a voice in the mainstream journals of economics. They don't get a voice on TV very often. So when you see Stephanie Kelton on mainstream media, that's a really big deal because they try and shut the door on heterodox economics. Heterodox just means outside the norm. And MMT, modern monetary theory, is a description of macroeconomics. And it really is largely a description of macroeconomics since the end of the Bretton Woods Accord on a sovereign free-floating fiat currency. And it describes what the implications are when we spend, when we tax, when we write policy. How do we gauge it? How do we view it? Now, when you drive into a local city sometime and you see people freezing, you need to understand that's a political choice. It's not necessary. We can afford to take care of them. We can afford housing. We can afford food. We can afford health care. Affordability is not the issue. Unfortunately, there's an awful lot of Calvinism still left in America today. Well, if you did better, you'd made a better choice, then you would be able to have better things. Hard work will get you where you need to be. Well, we know that's horseshit. We know that's not true. We know it's a lottery. It's a gamble. And once you fall off the wagon, it's almost impossible to get back on. The economy is built like a casino. You go into it, and most times you walk out with nothing. Sometimes not even the clothes on your back. So with that, I'm hoping that you all take some of these lessons, take some of this information, and teach somebody. Learn. Find, find videos. Deficit Alice is out there. They've got great information. A lot of it is our videos, which is nice. But don't, don't waste this time. Don't start cheering for Tulsi and Bernie and all the other ones yet. We need people to learn economics or we're going to get stuck with a neoliberal that doesn't know it. And then we're going to end up screwed. It truly is in our hands. And with that, my name is Steve Grumbine. I'm with Real Progressives. And I hope you have a great day. Hey.